Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you on the telephone from the West Coast. Uh, welcome to our program today entitled Lobbying and Political Activities, Rules of the Road for Nonprofits. Uh, welcome uh, to those of you here uh, in our uh, DC uh, conference facility uh, at Venable. Uh, we have about 100 folks here in the room uh, who have joined us for lunch and for our program today, and welcome to the uh, over 200 people that we have registered for the program on the phone today on the webinar component across the country. Uh, my name is Jeff Tenenbaum, chair of the nonprofit organization's practice at the Venable Law Firm. Um, and as you probably know, many of you know, this is part of a, an ongoing, now year-long series of monthly seminars and webinars that we've been doing on nonprofit legal issues, uh, which we plan to continue to do uh, for quite a long time to come. And uh, hopefully today's program uh, will not disappoint. Uh, today's, uh, today's topic is a, uh, an incredibly interesting one, which you're going to hear a lot about. Uh, we probably have more content squeezed into this uh, 90 minutes than any other program that we've done, which is going to be a challenge for all of our speakers and for you to digest. Uh, but I can certainly guarantee, and you can probably tell those of you in, in the room and by the heft of the, uh, the PowerPoint slides and the handout materials that you have, that there's no shortage of uh, content to cover today. A very broad, wide-ranging topic, but really critical information, uh, of course, very critical in an election year like we find ourselves now. Um, uh, first, I want to uh, recognize in the back of the room uh, George Constantine uh, standing there in the, in the back of the room. George is uh, co-chair of the regulatory practice group here at Venable and an integral leader in our nonprofit practice. Uh, and I want to introduce our, our speakers. Uh, to my immediate right is Ron Jacobs. Uh, Ron chairs Venable's political law practice uh, and has been a, an absolutely key member of our nonprofit practice for, for many years. Uh, works with many of you uh, here in the room and on the phone and many other uh, hundreds of our, our nonprofit clients and others uh, every year in dealing with a wide array of legal issues, probably most notably those involving lobbying and political activity. Uh, to Ron's right is Alex McGarris. Alex is an associate in our firm's New York office. Uh, previously, we had the luxury or the benefit of working with her in D.C. until she moved to New York, uh, but she remains a key part of our, our nonprofit practice and our regulatory group generally. Um, I've wor worked with Alex uh, for several years now in this area and others, and she's an absolutely first-rate lawyer who has some uh, great things to share with you today. And finally, the most recent addition to our team, Jeff Hunter, to Alex's right, uh, joined us uh, from another uh, prominent law firm uh, just a few months ago, uh, has already uh, fit in quite well, hit the ground running. Um, Jeff specialty is this area, that lobbying and political activity area, um, and he certainly has a lot to share with you here today. A few logistical issues, uh, like we typically do. Uh, we, well, actually, not like we typically do. Typically, we take questions throughout the program, um, kind of on an ongoing, nonstop basis. Because of the, the uh, large volume of content that we have to cover today, we're not going to be able to do that, unfortunately. Uh, we are going to have uh, uh, three defined spots, uh, breaks, natural breaks in the program, where we will take questions. So write down your questions, uh, and if they're not answered uh, in the course of the presentation, ask them at the appropriate time. Just raise your hands here in the room, and our speakers will repeat the questions for those of you on the phone. And for those of you on the webinar component, send in your questions at any time uh, through the chat feature on the webinar. I'll be monitoring that at the laptop here in the front of the room, and we'll pose those questions to our speakers at the appropriate times. But I do apologize in advance that I can guarantee you we're not going to be able to answer all of your questions here today, but we'll certainly stick around afterward, and we're always available to answer questions at any time. Um, handout materials, those of you uh, in the room have the, uh, a printed copy of the uh, PowerPoint presentation and, and uh, some ancillary uh, handout materials. Those of you in the webinar should have received as part of the confirmation email a link to the, uh, to the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and then tomorrow, uh, all of you will receive uh, an email with a link not only to all the presentation materials, but to a recording of the presentation like we always do. Those recordings and the PowerPoints are posted on our firm's website, um, so you can feel free to share those with colleagues and others who might be interested. And that recording will be posted tomorrow. Uh, we have three upcoming uh, programs scheduled that I just want to highlight for you. We're actually doing a second one, kind of a special, unique event uh, here uh, on April 20th entitled Good Counsel, Meeting the, Le Meeting the Legal Needs of Nonprofits. Uh, this is going to feature uh, uh, a good friend, Leslie Rosenthal, general counsel of the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts in New York, who just wrote a terrific new book uh, with that exact title, coincidentally. Um, and uh, Leslie and I are going to be doing a program um, uh, uh, late in the afternoon that day, uh, really kind of a, an extended question and answer session on a, a wide-ranging discussion of different nonprofit le legal issues, followed by a cocktail reception here at Venable. I hope you can join us for that. And then back to our traditional schedule, uh, next month, May 17th, 
Uh, I think the invitation just went out yesterday, uh, a program entitled Nonprofit Contracts, Best Practices, Negotiation Strategies, Practical Tips, and Common Pitfalls. Uh, with several of the uh, uh, core members of our nonprofit group leading that discussion. And finally, on June 13th, uh, a program entitled 10 Best Practices for Protecting Your Nonprofit's Intellectual Property. These programs are always done um, at lunch here from 12 to 12.30 Eastern Time and then 12.30 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time for the seminar and webinar component of the program. Uh, you can always find, uh, by the way, all of the uh, recordings of all of our um, Monthly seminar is available at Venable.com slash nonprofit slash recordings. Um, I want to thank, as always, uh, our marketing specialist, Jamie Fitzsimons, for the terrific job that she does in helping to organize these luncheons. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ron to get us started. Ron? Great. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone, for coming today and for everyone for being on the phone. <coughs> we'll um, cover three broad topics today, uh, lobbying disclosure and uh, the tax implications of lobbying the gift and entertainment rules that apply to your interactions with government officials, and then we'll finish up by talking about super PACs today in the brave new world of independent expenditure committees. Um, as we start with lobbying disclosure, we'll dive right in. As Jeff said, we'll get some, have a couple of breaks for questions as we go, so make sure that if we don't answer your questions through the, the program that you, uh, you, you're ready with them when, when the time comes. When we talk about tracking lobbying costs, the amount of, that you spend on lobbying, there are really two issues for most nonprofits and also for for-profits that um, why it's important. One is for disclosing those, your lobbying activities either to the federal government or to the applicable states. The other is for tax reasons. Uh, 501c3s have a limit on the amount of lobbying they may do. 501c6s are allowed to do unlimited lobbying, as are 501c4s, but c6s in particular uh, have to notify their members the portion of their dues that are non-deductible or pay a tax on that amount. So it's important um, that you're, you track for, for those two reasons. And what makes it particularly cumbersome is that there are different definitions of the word lobbying, um, whether you're dealing with the tax code, the Lobbying Disclosure Act, or state uh, lobbying disclosure laws. So what we want to do is start with a little bit is unpacking those different definitions, how they're similar, how they're different, so you can get a sense of um, when you're tracking your lobbying time, what exactly that means. Thank you, Ron. Uh, three definitions are available for a Lobbying Disclosure Act compliance. The first is the default definition in the LDA, and any organization can use those de uh, definitions. The certain 501c3 charities, those that have selected the precise definition of lobbying under 501h, can use uh, one of these IRS methods. And the other IRC method is available to 501c6s, 501c5s, um, and all three have their own benefits and costs associated with them. This chart shows the types of lobbying that each of these three definitions cover. You'll see that legislation is really the one common element. All three cover lobbying regarding legislation. Executive branch lobbying offers a bit more of a distinction. The LDA method and definition is very broad, covers a lot of uh, lobbying regarding regulation, uh, rates, rules, policy, et cetera. The one for associations and businesses, however, is very narrow, and charities, it just doesn't apply at all. The other big distinction you can see here in this chart is that the two tax code definitions cover state lobbying, grassroots lobbying, uh, international, uh, but not the LDA. It, it doesn't concern itself with grassroots, state, or other jurisdictions, only federal. When we're looking at what is lobbying for LDA purposes using the LDA definition, it comes down to communications with certain federal officials regarding legislation, regulations, policies, uh, contracts, grants, loans, permits, uh, basically as a shorthand, any federal matter. There are a number of exemptions. We're not going to go into detail here, uh, but this is a very broad definition. When we're looking at who you talk with in a federal government, or any government for that matter, uh, to be considered lobbying, you have to look at the, at the differences between the LDA and the tax code definitions. As a first matter, however, we want to point out that the 501c3 definition, as one for charities, really does not apply to executive branch lobbying. So we're not going to have any, um, yeah, the chart doesn't have any uh, positions listed there. When you look at the LDA versus the tax code definition that associations and businesses use, the LDA is, is very broad. It covers the President, White House, White House staff, all the way down through political appointees. 
However, the uh, tax code definition is, is a little bit more narrow um, in terms of federal officials. It's more broad when you look at state officials because uh, that, that would cover state, local, international. Uh, the best distinction, though, is in the executive office of the president. The LDA covers everyone in that White House uh, broad agency. However, the tax code really only applies um, to the White House office inside the um, executive office of the president and the two top officials in each of the other executive office of the president agencies like uh, USTR or um, drug control policy. With legislation, again, this is an area that all three definitions cover. And we see how the tax definitions cover more of that legislative lobbying uh, than does the LDA definition. The tax definitions, both for charities and for associations or businesses, uh, covers all levels of government, local, state, federal, international. Uh, it also covers federal civil service. Uh, folks on the GS schedule, the senior executive service, uh, those are covered under the tax definitions, but the LDA does not reach those. The LDA applies only to president, vice president, White House staff, uh, schedule uh, C political appointees, executive schedule one through five. That would be executive level one would be, for instance, a cabinet secretary. Um, in the departments, executive two through five would be uh, assistant secretaries, uh, down through even general counsel. Uh, in the, excuse me, general counsel, usually that would be on the, uh, the independent agency side with uh, commissioners. And really the, the key here is to think about <clears throat> which officials that you're meeting with are covered officials. So you may have the same contacts talking about a program or policy of the U.S. government. If you're meeting with a career employee, for example, it's not going to be lobbying contact under the LDA, but if you're meeting with a Schedule C person, it is. On the tax code methods, that same communication with a, a, a Schedule C political appointee is not considered to be lobbying, but <clears throat> it is under the LDA. So again, it's the differences between the different definitions that are important here and what we're, what we're talking about and whether it is or isn't lobbying. And we'll talk in a few minutes about some of the advantages of picking one of those methods to, to use to report on your lobbying disclosure report because you can um, simplify report under the tax code method, but it'll have impacts on the numbers that you'll report. So that's why we want to lay out this framework of, of the different kinds of contacts that are involved. So now we'll switch gears from um, lobbying under the LDA to uh, 501c3 lobbying. And the tax code includes definition of lobbying that applies specifically to organizations recognized um, as exempt under section 501c3 of the code. And as you can see, it broadly captures any attempt to influence specific legislation. And the first thing that should jump out at you is that it's limited to legislation and therefore uh, lobbying on um, administrative or executive branch action is not included in the definition. And the second um, thing about the definition um, is that it covers lobbying on all levels of government, whether it's local, state, or federal, and so it's broader in that regard. Um, and if you are a 501c3 that lobbies, you have to report your activities to the IRS, and if you lobby on the federal level, to Congress on your uh, Lobbying Disclosure Act reports. Um, and each of these um, reporting schemes want different information. So the IRS wants to know how much you spent on lobbying activities, which we'll talk about in the next slide in more detail, whereas Congress wants to know um, only federal activities, but more types of information, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. So 501c3s that lobby have to measure and report their lobbying activities, but they also have to limit their lobbying activities. Under the code, you can lobby, but so long as it's not a substantial part of your overall activities. And the code provides two methods for determining what is substantial. The first is the substantial part test, which is um, a very vague you know, facts and circumstances test that the IRS applies on a case-by-case -case basis. There's very little guidance um, to help an organization decide what is substantial. In some cases, uh, the IRS will look at what percentage of your overall budget is devoted to lobbying. Sometimes they'll look at what percentage of your activities um, is devoted to lobbying, which could be very different depending on the type of activities you do. And so organizations that use this method for determining their lobbying levels have to operate with a level of uncertainty, which a lot of organizations are just not comfortable with 
which is why many uh, take the alternative, which is making the so-called lobbying um, election under 501 uh, H of the code. And there you're um, measuring your lobbying strictly by a dollar amount spent on lobbying activities. And so long as you don't exceed the expenditure caps that are set forth in the law, your lobbying is not considered a substantial part of your overall activities and therefore it's okay. And these expenditure caps um, are a percentage of your overall budget and it's kind of it gradual. The thing to keep in mind is that there is a $1 million annual limit. Uh, these uh, caps were set in the 1970s. A million dollars may not seem that much for a lot of organizations with bigger budgets. And so that's one of the drawbacks of this test, although it provides a lot of um, you know, definitive ways to look at it, there's, there is a big limitation in that regard. Another benefit of the uh, election, which is very easy to make, you just fill out a form with the IRS, is that it provides very clear definitions of what is lobbying, which helps guide you know, how you report this information. So direct communications with uh, covered officials about legislation will be covered, um, and also grassroots lobbying. So any attempt to influence the public to in turn influence legislators will be um, par captured as part of your lobbying activities. Um, Alex, let me just add a couple points to that. This is Jeff Tenenbaum. Uh, first off, not only does uh, making the 501H election provide you with some very clear definitions of what's lobbying, but it also provides you with some very clear exceptions from the definition of lobbying, which can be very helpful in carving out activities that would otherwise probably be captured as lobbying under the substantial part test. Um, Another thing to keep in mind is that the IRS has made very clear that they prefer organizations that make the election, and they view organizations that make the election as tending to be more compliant uh, under the lobbying rules um, and perhaps less of an audit risk, uh, if that's what you're concerned about. Uh, as a general principle, we, we generally encourage our 501c3 clients who lobby to make the election except where um, your lobbying would simply be too great to be able to fit within the $1 million cap. And in our experience, that's usually the only reason why 501c3s who lobby don't make the election. It's where there's just no way they can do it within the $1 million cap. Thank you. Uh, looking into the other tax code definition, uh, this is the one that applies to associations, particularly trade associations in 501c6 and businesses. For businesses, uh, they cannot deduct the cost of covered lobbying. For associations, uh, they have to report the IRS, and trade associations in particular must pass this cost along to their members by uh, noting in a dues statement, for instance, what the percentage of their dues are attributed to non-deductible lobbying. Like the tax code version for charities, uh, this tax code definition covers influencing specific legislation uh, at, at the state, federal, international, other levels. Where it is very different, however, is it, um, it applies to uh, some executive branch lobbying for federal government, and that's regarding uh, the, the covered officials' positions or actions on executive matters like regulation, uh, executive orders, that sort of thing. Um, also, this definition covers intervening in elections. So if you um, are a corporate tax uh, sorry, a corporate uh, business's uh, PAC manager or PAC manager of a trade association, the time you spend administering your PAC would fall under this definition and would be subject to reporting or non-deductibility, et cetera. Um, also, uh, this tax code definition covers grassroots lobbying, and oftentimes we found that that is one of the more expensive parts of lobbying. If you open up virtually any edition of The Hill or Politico, you'll find a full-page ad urging readers to contact a member of Congress regarding a certain bill. Um, all that is reportable and non-deductible. And so we've um, <clears throat> talked about sort of the various different definitions, and one of the key things, as we mentioned, is that when you're doing your lobbying disclosure reports is that you have to disclose the amount you spend on lobbying per quarter. And one of the things that the Lobbying Disclosure Act allows you to do is either report under the LDA method or if you're a 501c6, use the, the 162e tax code method to report your lobbying expenses or if you're a charity that's made the 501H election, you can <coughs> um, use your, that, that set of tax code definitions for lobbying. So what the, the, the interesting thing is that the, you're, in some ways you're comparing apples to oranges because you could have two identically uh, situated associations um, that one uses the LDA method, 
One uses the Internal Revenue Code method to report their lobbying expenses, and they report widely different numbers for the exact same activity because the, the definitions are a little bit different. So now we'll talk a little bit about, um, <clears throat> with that in mind, the, the pros and cons of either electing to use the tax code method to do your reporting to simplify things, or sticking with the LDA definitions to try and determine what's the best number to report. And be before we get into that, just one point of clarification, make sure we're all on the same page, and most of you know this. But the, the rules for 501c3s and 501c6s, we've been comparing and contrasting the definitions themselves. But of course, the underlying purposes of those rules are very, very different. Uh, 501c3s are allowed to lobby, but only within certain prescribed limits. And we talked about the, the two different ways to calculate those limits. Um, 501c6s can engage in unlimited lobbying. In fact, you could have a c6 that does nothing but lobby. But you do have to track your lobbying time and related expenses, both in-house and out-of-pocket costs, um, and then total up those costs, divide it by your total membership dues and similar revenue, and that resulting percentage is a percentage that members' membership dues are non-deductible to those members as a business expense. So there is a financial cost to the members, at least members who take business tax deductions for their dues, but there's no limitation on the lobbying. just wanted to make sure you understood the distinctions. Thank you. Um, when you're looking at this choice of, of definitions, really it's between either the LDA or one of the tax code definitions. And the right choice will depend on your circumstances and what's unique to your organization. If you look at the LDA definition, it's, it's pretty simple. It applies only to federal. Uh, the rules are very, they're, they're laid out. It's not as uh, fact dependent as say the, uh, the, the facts and circumstances test for certain uh, charities. Uh, but on the downside is you might wind up reporting more lobbying and more um, lobbyists, more employees as lobbyists regarding executive branch lobbying because it has a broader reach into executive branch lobbying than does the tax code version for uh, 501c6s and for businesses. The code definitions give you the benefit of just calculating the cost once. You have to do that for IRS anyway if you're covered by, by one of the two tax code definitions, and you simply restate that number by rounding it up, or sorry, rounding it to the nearest uh, 10,000 increment for LDA purposes. Uh, one of the downsides of using tax code definition is you're probably going to have an inflated lobbying expenditure amount. A number of uh, organizations are very sensitive to having large financial amounts disclosed uh, publicly. Uh, when you wrap in the cost of state lobbying, uh, grassroots lobbying, et cetera, uh, that can multiply what you report for federal purposes by the, uh, several magnitudes. And when we say uh, that it inflates, it, you're, you're reporting an accurate number, but it's a number on your federal lobbying disclosure report that includes state lobbying, it includes grassroots lobbying, that those who use the LDA method don't have to report. So it's not to say that it's not an accurate number, it's just a number that doesn't necessarily reflect your federal lobbying numbers. So that's um, why that can sometimes be a reason to actually keep two sets of books. We've had some clients where their, their number was significantly higher than a lot of other um, organizations in a similar space, and so they decided that they would switch to the LDA method, keep the two sets of books, but have their numbers be a little more in line uh, with other folks' numbers. So we've talked now about the, the, some of the tax code, either restrictions on lobbying for C3s or for um, um, <clears throat> the, the uh, non-deductible issues for C6s, the general idea of, of calculating lobbying costs. But now let's talk a little bit more about what it is you're reporting on the LDA when you file your, your lobbying disclosure reports and when you have to file those reports. The first question is, who are your lobbyists? And the LDA has a pretty simple test. We call it the two contacts and 20% test. An employee has to have made two contacts with a covered official regarding a federal matter, or if you use the tax code definitions, a, uh, a federal covered matter uh, under the uh, tax code, and spend 20% of his or her time during that quarter uh, or during a calendar quarter engaging in lobbying activities. This 20%, uh, that period could be a, a much smaller amount of time as say the person is a part-time employee where 20% of their workload is a, few, is a smaller number of hours than someone who's a full-time employee. When we're talking about lobbying activities, it includes not only contacting the covered uh, official regarding uh, the covered uh, uh, matter, but also includes background uh, work. Uh, preparing for a meeting, coordinating, uh, say, a common lobbying effort with trade association lobbyists, supervising outside 
uh, lobbying firms, and particularly uh, support work of others. While you're reporting the cost and names of your employee lobbyists, you also have to report the cost of your non-employee lobbyists who are doing background work. And the test is, do they intend to use that work or to provide that work uh, for a lobbying contact in the future? The classic example is a reporter, uh, sorry, a researcher who's assigned to prepare a report that the lobbyists will use in a Capitol Hill visit. That researcher's time is all countable towards lobbying um, expenditure costs. But if the researcher takes, the, uh, sorry, if the lobbyist takes the same report off the shelf and the report was prepared for some other purpose, then only the lobbyist time counts as lobbying. So all entities that do federal lobbying have to file uh, quarterly reports with each House of Congress reporting these activities. And there are kind of four buckets of information that are reported on the LD2. The first is how much you actually spent on lobbying, which we'll cover in detail in the following slides. Second, who lobbied uh, and individual inter, uh, issues based on the 20% and two context test Jeff just described. Third, what issues did you actually lobby? And a lot of organizations kind of provide very vague or you know, broad descriptions about what they lobbied. And we encourage you to take a, a advantage of this opportunity to kind of describe the issues lobbied in a, po in a fa positive fashion because some of these reports will be examined by competitors or what have you. And then finally, you have to identify um, which House of Congress or agency um, was actually lobbied. And so with the amount spent, I mean, we get many questions from clients about how to allocate expenses to lobbying, especially um, where an organization doesn't have a clearly defined government affairs division, which you could say basically everything they do falls in that bucket. And so you have to kind of figure out ways to allocate employee time, which we'll discuss in the next slide, because it's one of the more complicated things you have to do in coming up with this final number. The direct cost of a, a lobbying contest, if you're flying in the head of your organization to meet with a member of Congress, the cost of that flight, for example, would be included in uh, the amount reported. Uh, how much you give to your outside lobbyists that do lobbying on your behalf. Um, Lobbying-related dues that are paid to um, a membership organization that you, uh, your entity might belong to. And then finally, you have to decide um, how, how to allocate overhead costs to lobbying, which is not always easy to do, especially if you don't have like a Washington, D.C. arm of your uh, entity that does basically only your lobbying. And so we generally recommend um, you identify the percentage um, the employee time that's going to get allocated into lobbying costs, and then apply that percentage to your overhead to include that there. And talking about um, employee time, this is a particularly difficult if you have employees that wear multiple hats in your organization, one of which is a lobbyist. Um, and, and how you decide how much of their time to allocate really depends on the method you're using whether LDA or one of the uh, tax code methods for calculating your lobbying activities. Of course, um, for example, you know, when you're reporting what legislation you lobbied on, if you're using the LDA definition, you're only going to report the lobbying time spent on federal legislation. But if you're using one of the tax code methods, you're going to have to also capture uh, the amount of time used for state lobbying, which very often will involve different employees in the organization. Another example is grassroots lobbying. Um, if you're using the tax code method, that's going to have to be included. And very often that includes media time if you're you know, putting a commercial, encouraging people to contact their legislator, um, or other types of campaigns they use, whether it's the web, to figure out what those costs are. But if you use the LDA method, that will not be included. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that um, all the supporting activities that I call like the behind the scenes work that Jeff mentioned, and the research that went into uh, uh, maybe a white paper or talking points, that also has to be captured somehow. And so it's not just the lobbyists that are, um, have to capture the time, it's any employee that would be doing this kind of behind the scenes research that doesn't meet that two contacts and 20% threshold test. And that's, I, I think one of the, the more common areas that people get tripped up and they spend all their time thinking about, okay, who's a lobbyist? Who spent 20% of their time on lobbying activities and made the lobbying contacts? We'll make sure we capture their time but then they, they may neglect to think about someone in the legal department, for example, who's doing research that the lobbyists are going to use for their, um, their lobbying <coughs> um, contacts. So we've talked now about the, the quarterly report where you disclose your lobbying activities. There's one other report at the federal level that you have to file, and that's the LD203 report. Um, this report was part of the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act uh, sort of ethics reforms in the wake of the Jack Abramoff scandals. 
And <clears throat> excuse me, if you think th about it at that time, the, the mindset of this legislation was that, that um, lobbyists are only as effective as their pocketbooks. Um, they make contributions to candidates, they max out there, they max out to their leadership packs, they give to the candidates uh, pet charities and the lawmakers pet charities, they hold all kinds of crazy events that honor and recognize covered officials, and that's the only way that lobbyists ever got anything accomplished. So they created this LD203 report that's designed to be filed by each organization that's registered under the LDA and each lobbyist who's listed on the LD2 reports. Um, the, the great um, disappointment of all the reform groups that pushed that legislation is that at the end of the day, very little gets disclosed on the LD203 because there just isn't as much of that kind of activity that's going on. Um, Jack Abramoff just got out of jail. He was doing things that were already illegal um, that didn't need all the ethics reforms um, to be changed. So we're gonna talk about the LD203 report there's very little that actually gets disclosed, but it's important to make sure that you're accurately completing the report because, as we all know, the cover-up is worse than the crime in Washington, and so if you fail to report the information you're supposed to report, then you have a false statement kind of problem, so we want to make sure you understand how to do the report. So basically, I, I mentioned there are different categories of contributions that are supposed to be reported on the LD203, and those include federal political contributions, um, certain events that honor and recognize covered officials, certain kinds of meetings, presidential um, library contributions. I still don't remember any huge contribution scandal about giving to presidential library funds, but that's one of the things that have to be reported. And then any um, presidential inaugural committee contributions as well. And so we'll, we'll unpack each of those in a little bit of detail here. Uh, the first is for the Federal Election Campaign Act contributions. And here you have to report, keep in mind this is for, if, if you're, it's the organization's report, you report any contribution that the organization's PAC made to a federal candidate. And if it's an individual, you're reporting your own contributions. So if you're the lobbyist that's filing the report, these are your own political contributions. And these are contributions of $200 or more um, made during the semi-annual period to federal candidates, leadership PACs, or federal political parties. This report is fascinating to me because the, the Federal Election Campaign Act already requires the recipients to disclose any contributions that aggregate above $200. So if you made a contribution of $250, the candidate was reporting it, there are some easy lookup functions, you can figure out the lobbyist who did it. Here you have to disclose $200 or above. So what we've accomplished is basically disclosing that broad universe of contributions of exactly $200 that had never been disclosed before. So that's um, what we have to do with this uh, report. And you simply report the date and the amount of each contribution. And keep in mind, you don't report contributions to your own organization's PAC, to other PACs that aren't leadership PACs, or in any state contributions aren't disclosed either. That next category is to pay certain kinds of meeting expenses. These are the, the cost of a meeting, retreat, conference, or a similar event held by or in the name of one or more covered legislative or executive branch officials. Now, the first thing that comes to mind in a lot of these are sort of the, the, um, the speaker's um, golf outing that he might have or um, something like that. Those are usually campaign events, and those are reported under the, the, the campaign contribution section. I've yet to find an organization that holds the John Boehner Leadership Institute um, that has to report these kind of things. There just don't seem to be very many at all that, that get reported. There's the next category, sort of a broad category of honoring expenses. Um, these are, there's a couple of different categories. The first are payments to an entity that's named for a covered legislative branch official. So if you endow a chair at a, un at a university, for example, um, a payment in recognition of a legislative official. So the example there would be if you um, invite a member to speak at your dinner and you, you make a donation to a charity in that member's name. Um, what's interesting here is that it does not include uh, um, expenses to, for covered executive branch officials in this little narrow category here. So keep that in mind. The other category is to, are, are payments to pay the cost of an event to honor or recognize a covered executive or legislative branch official. Now, this seems like a broad definition category, but it actually is fairly narrow at the end of the day. If your organization puts on an event to honor or recognize an official, and we'll talk about what these events are, you're gonna to have to disclose. If you make a direct contribution to another organization for the purpose of putting on an event, it'll be disclosed on your LD203 report. I find very few individual lobbyists who, make these, who, who ever make contributions to support these efforts. It's usually only organizations. But if you're buying tickets, buying tables in an event, or if you're a sponsor of an event, you don't have to disclose on the LD203 report. Um, so that gets a little bit complicated. We'll talk about a couple of examples in a second. A couple of things that don't have to be disclosed. If you have an event where you have honorary co-hosts, um, that does not turn the event into one that honors or recognizes a covered official. 
Um, if you use the term the honorable in front of the member's name like you're supposed to do for, for um, protocol reasons, it doesn't make it an honoring or recognizing event. If the member is just speaking or is a special invitee, it doesn't turn the event into one to honor or recognize a covered official. It's only when you're giving a particular uh, Legislator of the Year award, hand, um, some other particular recognition for the member. And so the question then is, if you have one of these, what has to be reported? And the answer is that you report the specific plaque or other little trophy that you give to the member. And then if you're doing it in the context of an event where there are costs associated, you have to report the, the costs of the event. So if you're having a dinner, for example, you report the cost of the dinner, um, which can get fairly high and may, it may look odd to people who suddenly say you've, you've spent $10,000 on an event to honor or recognize a member of Congress. So if you're concerned about that, I often suggest give the award to the member in his office or her office, have them speak at the dinner, and don't give out the award at the dinner, and then you don't have to worry about the costs of the dinner. A couple of examples here. Um, this is an event um, that uh, an organization in town, Tracy's Kids, did, and it's they have uh, they use the the uh, they had honorable co-hosts. If, if you were Tracy's Kids or you're the organization putting this event on, you wouldn't have to disclose the event because it's just using the honorable title. If um, the thing is at the event, they have uh, they presented their sixth annual Courage Award to a member of Congress. So this is an example of an event that we're talking about to honor or recognize. So if this were your event as the organization, that's an example of, of one that you would have to disclose. The uh, final point about this invitation that I thought was interesting is that the top of it says, uh, we will contribute to, and the winner is Tracy's Kids. And as you remember before, I talked about you report your own events or you report contributions made specifically to support an event, but you don't report sponsorship. So as you can see from the rest of this page, it really looks like a sponsorship package. There, there are ticket packages, tables that you can buy, but they made the, 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 the top of it was really, I will contribute to this organization. At the end of the day, I think it's, it's just, inartful drafting of the language in that really this is a sponsorship package and you wouldn't have to disclose if you bought one of those sponsorship packages. There's another category of um, contributions that have to be reported. If they are um, um, made, by, made to an entity that is established, financed, maintained, controlled, or designated by a covered official. So if you have um, an organization that a member of Congress runs, for example, um, that would have to be disclosed. The question that always was, was difficult was what does it mean to be designated by a covered official? And what the guidance from the clerk and the secretary says is that that official has to have some role in the governance of the organization. They can't, it's more than just an honorary or ex officio member, but they um, have to have, uh, if they have voting board membership, for example, that's enough. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is if it was established by um, the member of Congress before um, he or she became a member of Congress and they've disaffiliated themselves with it in that formal leadership role, that's not designated by. So a couple of examples. Here's an event where you've got a huge list of honorary co-hosts. So if, a, if the covered official handed you that invitation and said, We'd, I'd really like you to support this event, wouldn't have to disclose the contribution you made to it because that they're just honorary co-hosts. However, the email that sent that invitation out was from a scheduler for a member of Congress. And in that email, the person said, I'm on the board of the organization. So that would make it a contribution designated by a covered official. So um, I, I, I note that this email that I received was really an email that was to sort of the who's who of the lobbying community in Washington. It was against the Senate ethics rules to send an invitation for a charitable or a, event like that anyway. It was for a good cause, I understand, but um, it, it you know, became one that would have to be reported under the LD203 and was technically an ethics violation. So we've now talked about the... Um, the federal reporting, Jeff's going to spend just a couple minutes on state issues. We obviously can't talk about the specifics of state reports, but we wanted to give you a flavor of some of the issues that are, if you're involved in the states, that you might just think about in terms of reporting. And then when we're done with that, we'll, we'll take your questions about all of these lobbying issues. State lobbying rules really cover the gamut. Uh, they're all different from each other in the federal model, but we can give you three common themes. They change frequently. There's no uniform reporting rule that states follow, and most, it, they all have different triggers. You have to really know before you go, uh, especially with the states that require you to register before you start lobbying. Looking to what the states consider lobbying, the scope's all going to vary, but there are three basic buckets. Legislative lobbying, which virtually every state regulates. Executive lobbying, which 
I'd say most states uh, regulate to some extent, although some of them really limit executive branch lobbying to lobbying the governor or the governor's staff regarding the acceptance or uh, veto of legislation. But it could also be pretty broad and, and include uh, rate cases, regulations, policy. And the, the final part here would be procurement or government contracting. Often that's wrapped up into executive branch lobbying, but sometimes there's a separate definition for it. In some of those states, there's even a separate reporting scheme. So if you're an executive branch lobbyist, you have to register once. If you're a procurement lobbyist, lobbyist you have to register again or mark off on a form. And they will have separate reporting requirements. Looking to who registers, again, wide gamut. Outside lobbyists might register. The organization itself might register. Uh, In-house lobbyists, perhaps some combination. Uh, in New York State, most organizations that have employees who lobby uh, register as an organization and list their employee lobbyists, uh, and those employee lobbyists pretty much just report up. And this is one area that, that differs significantly from the federal rules. If, if you're registered under the LDA, your organization files the quarterly report, you list your lobbyists on there. The point here is that individual employees have to file their own reports, the organization may have to file its own reports, your outside lobbyist file reports. And also, unlike the federal where if you have just an outside lobbyist, you don't have in-house lobbyist, the outside lobbyist does the filing. In a lot of states, both, in, both sides of the equation have to file reports. Thresholds really apply to when you have to register and, and who is a lobbyist or a lobbying firm or even a client for that matter. Uh, the federal government really provides the most generous threshold, two contacts and 20%. Uh, many states require you to register before lobbying or within five days of your first five-minute phone call of lobbying. Um, others provide you a you know, slightly generous percentage of time. For instance, if you spend less than 10% of your work time, then, then maybe you don't have to lobby. The more common one would be hours worked or on a financial basis. Um, Massachusetts uses, for instance, a kind of uh, a hybrid approach. Uh, for both legislative and executive branch lobbying, They'll excuse a person from registering if that person spends less than 25 hours lobbying a six-month period and earns less than $25,000 in that six-month period. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, gifts, uh, oftentimes the amount of money you spend on a permissible gift, whether it's a, a meal, travel, um, free attendance at an event, uh, sometimes that can trigger registration, just as if it was money given to a lobbying firm or spent by your employees um, uh, to, to lobby. When it comes time to reporting, um, you want to look not only between states for how they're different, but also within a state. In some states, you have to register and report separately for executive branch lobbying and legislative branch lobbying. Um, we're fairly used to the federal system where you, you report your activity once a quarter. In the states, it might be monthly, it might be quarterly, uh, it might be weekly in some instances. Uh, when you get into legislative branch lobbying, perhaps it's on that schedule during this, the general session, then there's a period of inactivity where no reports are due until a special session comes up. Uh, frustratingly, you might have the same state where you have monthly reports for legislative and quarterly for executive lobbying, and the contents will vary too. Uh, logically, the legislative uh, forms are going to focus on bills and, you know, et cetera. Uh, but sometimes, uh, perhaps the more common one is where they group them all together, where you report your lobbyists, your money, and your, um, your issues and contacts. Um, approving reports. Again, as Ron said, the difference between federal and state is with the federal system, we report on an organization basis. So it's pretty easy. You do one report, you send it out. In the states, it might be individuals and organization, a lobbying firm, some combination thereof. Uh, in a few instances, for instance, Pennsylvania, everyone has to approve their own reports. So you have your outside lobbyists filing reports, your, in, uh, your, your client, and they have to look at each other and say, yes, that, that's correct. So you have to have more communication with your individual lobbyists and your outside folks. When we're looking at what you report, the context, the issues lobbied, you really have to look at the definition. In the states where uh, it's a very broad definition, you'll probably be reporting more. Um, in some states, it's confusing because you have to have very precise records of who you contact and when. For instance, in New York, you have to have your lobbyists, 
the officials they contacted in, in New York, by the way, the covered officials is, is everybody from um, firemen up through the governor, and the amount you spend. When you report the same information on a New York City report, I realize it's not state, but you would have to tie your issue and your lobbyist and your government official together in one uh, distinct uh, disclosure within the form. So you can't just keep track of, oh, I kept contacted 10 uh, legislators and I did two bills. You have to, have to, um, to tie them together. And uh, finally, when you're reporting costs in the state, um, you're looking at the amount of money you spend or for lobbying firms what they earn, but also often gifts. And gift reporting can get more complex than just reporting money because um, I guess we'll get into that in, a, in the next part. Yep. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Jeff. So we'll, now we'll turn it over, uh, open up the floor for some questions. Um, yeah, while, while you guys are formulating your questions, uh, one question uh, uh, harking back to something that was uh, touched on a little bit earlier, and it's something that we get a question, we get questioned on quite a bit from, from uh, clients, and that is, in terms of determining what is a, a lobbying cost, uh, really both for the 501c6 and the 501c3 rules, uh, Ron, what's the general guidance that, that you typically give to clients on the question of, okay, clearly we know lobbying communications. We spent a lot of time discussing which communications and with whom are going to be covered under the lobbying definitions and which are not under, uh, under the tax and the LDA rules. But in terms of sometimes what are some of the more significant costs, all the background research and studies and reports in um, uh, whether uh, hiring outside uh, consultants to do it or doing it in-house, uh, things that may have in part uh, be being done in part for lobbying purposes to be used in a later lobbying campaign, but oftentimes for other purposes, completely non-lobbying related. What's the general guidance that you give to clients on how to capture those costs or not in your lobbying totals? Sure. The big, the big issue, the, 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 the way to approach it is, in, is to allocate the cost. If, as Jeff used in his example before, if you have a report that you know is going to be used, you, that the lobbyist says, researcher, we need to do this report for our lobbying campaign, then it's 100% lobbying. More likely is when you have a situation where you have um, a variety of people commissioning a report, we're going to use it to talk to our members about this issue, we're going to use it to uh, communicate with uh, the, the Hill on an issue, we're going to use it in the states to talk about various issues. And then it's really do your best to allocate the cost. One of the things about lobbying reporting is that there's far more art than science in the process. It's not like a, a PAC report for political action committee where you've got your bank account, your FEC report, and the numbers match up and you know you're right. With lobbying, it's much more a function of figuring out if, if it's lobbying, if it's in a gray area. And so the typical example might be where you know your report's going to be used with your membership and um, legislatively and then for the, the states, you would probably allocate that a third, a third, a third, and that can really reduce some of the costs. Um, you, know, you want to be careful not to, to game the system. Oh, we're going to use it with our members and give it to, you know, the report to one member and be done with it. You want to have an accurate sort of uh, um, documentation of the time you're doing it, why you're doing it, but as long as you have, I think, a, fair, a reasonable allocation method, it's appropriate. Okay, other questions over here? So the question is, um, do, or the two-part question, the first is, do payments to outside lobbying firms count as a lobbying cost? And the answer is yes. If, if there's a bit of a, it, it feels like double counting because your outside lobbyist is filing a report saying you paid them $20,000 a quarter. Um, your number has your internal cost as well as the $20,000. That feels like double counting, but that's the way it's supposed to be done and each side is supposed to, uh, to report that way. And so I've had a couple of conversations with reporters before asking about this, and I've explained to them that you subtract out the numbers from the outside lobbyists. You don't add them together. Your other question was uh, about whether um, software like, such as Contact Congress that you use for facil facilitating contacts with Congress is counted. If, it's, if you're using that subscription for the purposes of making lobbying contacts, you'd probably allocate part of it to, to lobbying if there are other purposes as well. If it's more of a grassroots type system um, that, that you're using for a web portal to communicate with members of Congress, that's going to be grassroots lobbying. And, if you're, and for tax code purposes, it would be. But for, um, 
for LDA purposes, it wouldn't be. And it also depends on the messages you're using, if it's for one of those uh, pieces of software that allow you to, to send letters to members of Congress. Um, is it really, is it talking about specific legislation as opposed to a general issue area? Yeah, I think as a general rule, any expense that you incur for, the, for a purpose of supporting later lobbying communications is going to have to be treated at least in part as a lobbying expense. And if that's the only purpose for which you're incurring the expense, then you probably need to capture it all as a lobbying expense. Uh, one side note that's important to note, uh, we've talked about this distinction between direct lobbying and grassroots lobbying. Uh, the most important place it comes into play is for 501c3s who have a sub-limit on grassroots lobbying. That for one to make a 501h election, it's 25 percent of your, of your total lobbying limit. So that's why what you capture as grassroots lobbying is a very significant number for 501c3s. Uh, other questions? Over here. Yeah, I understand that if you're invited to testify before a committee of the, or a subcommittee of the House or the Senate or uh, a county council and uh, state or city council uh, uh, to solicit views if you're representing, let's say, disabled children or elderly or whatever your organization is an expert in, that doesn't count as lobbying, is that right? Even the preparation of your testimony. Right, so the question was if you are invited to testify before a committee at the federal, state, or local level, whether that counts as lobbying, whether it requires uh, your preparation time to be included. And the answer is no. When you're testifying before Congress, there's an exemption from the LDA that doesn't count. So the time you spend preparing your testimony, same at the local level. I think the vast majority of state, lo state lobbying disclosure laws as well exempt testifying before Congress. Now, something to be careful of is if you're making the rounds talking to the committee members beforehand, um, that would be lobbying, um, depending on the, the, the subject, and so the, the cost of the, the, your time spent doing the rounds with the committee members would be treated as lobbying. And, and one postscript to that, of course, any question like that has to be answered with which definition are you talking about? Uh, Ron's answer was completely accurate under the LDA definition. Um, under the uh, rules for 501c3 organizations that make the 501h election, there also is an exemption uh, for lobbying that results from an invitation. I think it has to actually come from the committee chair, if I remember, um, to testify, to give testimony. And if, if it falls into that particular bucket, that's one of those exceptions I talked about from the rules for 501c3s. I don't recall there being a similar exemption under the uh, 162e rules for, for 501c6 organizations, though. So it really depends. For tax purposes, it's going to depend on whether you're a C3 or a C6 and, and which definitions you're looking at. Um, in the back there. So the question here is uh, whether, what we mean by international lobbying. And this is an interesting area. The IRS, it's not in the regulations, it's not in the statute, but it's in their manual, one of their guidance manuals. Um, they treat it, lobbying foreign governments as a category of lobbying to be included in your, in your tax code methods. So if you're lobbying the EU, uh, for example, on legislative matters, the cost there would be attributable to the Internal Revenue Code lobbying. Okay, one more question in the back of the room, then we have to move on. The question is, at what point in time do we advise clients to set up a C4? And I presume you mean if you're a C6, a C3, rather, in the creating C4. And, and the answer to that question is basically if you're, if you can make the 501H election and you're bumping up against the million dollar limit, then certainly the opportunity there is then to create a related 501C4. The courts have said that a C3, even though it's limited in the amount of lobbying it can do, is allowed to have an affiliated C4 that has an unlimited amount of lobbying. Um, so if you're bumping up against the, the, the hard cap of a million, that's one option. Um, if, you're, um, if, you're, if you're under the facts and circumstances test, it's sort of, it, it's, you have to look at each one individually and just get a sense of, you know, where it works out. There's some, there, there are definitely some transaction costs involved to doing that, not just setting up the C4, but allocating staff time, allocating expenses. So although it can be very useful to, to sort of um, unleash your lobbying capability, um, it really, I think you have to be ready to go to the, sort of the next level and really engage in a significant additional amount of lobbying. And there are many organizations around the city, uh, C3s, that have set up affiliated C4s to engage in unlimited lobbying. A very common practice, the Supreme Court uh, kind of ratified that structure a number of years ago. Um, the most important factor to keep in mind that we always stress to clients who are doing this analysis of whether to set up the related C4 is that the C4 has to have independent funding. 
you can't just take money from the C3 and give it to the C4. The C4 is going to have to have money coming into it directly. So if you have a base of donors or members or supporters or others uh, to whom you could ask to split their contributions or their dues, to give some to the C3 and some to the C4, that works quite well. But if that's really impossible, if people are relying on the C3's uh, you know, charitable status in order to take charitable tax deductions, and that's the only way you're getting contributions and grants into the organization, and it's impossible to really get them to give to the C4 directly, then that can be a real problem, and that's something to, to keep in mind. Okay, let's move on to the next part of the program. So we'll now talk about the uh, gift rules, uh, the gift and entertainment, and we're going to do this in a, in a very uh, superficial treatment, unfortunately, just to make sure we can get through the time, but to really give you a sense of, of just what some of the rules are. So we're going to start with the federal rules, and when you consider the rules that apply to what you can offer or provide um, a federal public official, you have to uh, first consider uh, where they sit. And so the rules differ whether you're uh, in person to, in Congress or in the executive branch. Um, and the general rules which we have set forth on this slide is that if you are an organization that has either an in-house lobbyist or high, retains an outside lobbyist, you cannot provide or offer um, a public official or employee of Congress or member of Congress anything unless an exemption applies. Same thing with the individual lobbyists. Other organizations that do not um, have lobbying ties can give gifts um, of, of, of up to $50. Um, then going to the executive branch, you have uh, treatment of career uh, uh, employees, those that are not political appointees, and then people that are political appointees. And career um, employees can accept gifts up to $20 or less um, from lobbyists and non-lobbyists. When we talk about uh, people who work in the administration, political appointees, uh, they have to sign the Obama Ethics Pledge, which uh, has heightened restrictions on what they can accept um, from lobbyists, organizations that retain lobbyists. And there you have to have an exemption in order to offer them something. And so you see that all the action is in the exemptions. And we're only going to cover a handful because there are several, focusing on uh, the ones that kind of let you invite um, a public official to an event. First, we'll talk about gifts that are given based on personal friendship, which is permitted. The question is, what is a bona fide person gift given out of personal friendship? And the kind of two rules of thumb that we use is first, are you seeking reimbursement from your employer? If that's the case, it's not a gift given out of personal friendship. And second, uh, you know, the committees will look at the history of the, of the relationship. Um, how, how old is it? Is it your college roommate or was it really formed based on lobbying contacts that has evolved into a, uh, you know, a friendship? If there's a mutual exchange of gifts or is it really just all going from, from you to the official. Um, and then finally, the, Congress, the rules that apply to members um, and employees of Congress is a $250 limit, and that, does not, um, that limit does not apply for uh, executive branch employees. And so now here we're going to talk, start talking about the different exemptions that allow you to invite and host public officials at events. And the one that is often um, you know, taken advantage of is also difficult to understand is exemption for widely attended events. And basically, you know, they, the criteria that lets you take advantage of this exemption differs depending on the uh, type of official for Congress. Uh, the event, the mem member or employee invited either has to be participating in like the speaking role or um, has to make the determination that his or her attendance is related to uh, official duties. There's also a threshold. You have to kind of expect at least 25 non congressional employees to attend, and there's also um, kind of an audience prerequisite. You have to have individuals from throughout a given industry or profession or individuals that represent a wide a range of interests. Um, the widely attended events exemption for um, political appointees in the executive branch are more restricted. You, the indiv individual invited basically has to speak or participate, you know, address the audience um, in order to take advantage and attend. Um, if, for in terms of the threshold of people, if you're uh, not the sponsor of the event, you need to have more than 100 people uh, attending. If you are the sponsor, there is no number. And similarly with the audience, you have to have like, a diversity of interests that are attending. For career uh, employees in the executive branch that just need to make a determination, this attendance will be uh, in, you know, in the interest of, uh, of his agency. Um, when you do meet the criteria for a widely attended event, you could basically cover all costs associated with that event, meals, entertainment that's part of the actual event, attendance fees, generally um, 
when you have an executive uh, branch member that's speaking, they, he can only accept free attendance the day of um, his speech, not, not the full day, not the whole, uh, uh, if it's a two-day event, not the second day. Um, moving on to um, receptions. Now, if you want to host an event, you don't meet the criteria for the widely attended event, which is pretty strict. You can still invite um, public officials to a reception style, so long as you're not offering food that's part of a meal. So hors d'oeuvres are fine, you know, for a breakfast event, you know, muffins, bagels, finger food. Um, and there's no limit on, there's no minimum limit on who has to attend. Basically, it just can't be a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, the rules that apply to uh, members and employees of Congress have a separate exemption for charitable events. Uh, the prerequisites there is it's got, the primary purpose of the event has to be to raise funds for the charitable cause. And secondly, um, you have to, the, the invitation has to come from the sponsor of the event. So if you're contributing to the, to the event um, and, you know, for example, get a table, you can't extend an invitation to a member of Congress or an employee. The invitation has to come from the sponsor of the event. And there, the House rules actually allow you, as a contributor to the event, to make a suggestion to the sponsor, I'd like, you know, member X to sit at my table, so long as the actual invitation and ultimate discretion is with the sponsor. The Senate takes a harder line, and so that does not really work there. Um, the executive branch rules do not have a special exemption for charitable events. You really need to have it fall under the widely attended events exemption to, to do that. And now we'll talk uh, just very briefly about the state rules and how they differ from the federal and differ among each, among each other. Things to look at. Sorry, some things to look at when you're considering the state gift rules are, you know, what are the exemptions? Uh, many states have very few. Uh, sometimes it's just a hard dollar limit. Uh, Michigan, for instance, permits gifts up to $57. Uh, that would permit most meals, uh, at, at some attend, uh, event attendance, uh, some things like coffee mugs. Uh, but others, um, have fewer exemptions or have very strict limits on lobbyists. When you're registered in a state um, and that has a, a lobbyist gift ban, obviously those gift bans apply. But sometimes um, when you're, as we said earlier, when you make gifts and you're not a lobbyist, that might trigger lobbying uh, either alone or in combination with other payments for lobbying. Oftentimes you'll have to report the amount of gifts you provide. In some states you have to give the recipient of the gift and the amount uh, the, the gift was worth and even when it was. The more strict of those states require you to give an advanced copy to the recipient. So if you invite 20 members of the legislature to a, a legislative reception and you give them their advanced copy that says you know, the average cost is say $25, you might get a response back from the member saying, well, gee, I attended, but I didn't have a drink, I didn't have a meal, why do I have a $25 gift? I don't want to see this on your report. You have to report it anyway, but that creates some friction with uh, the state officials. So notification is, is often tricky. So with the gift rules being all over the place, uh, with the federal rules having um, sometimes conflicting or at least not harmonized exemptions, what are some things you can do for compliance? The first is if you're involved in multiple states, make sure you know the state rules. There's not a simple minimum approach that you can take across states. You have to know each individual state's rules. Um, what, another thing to keep in mind is that you know, a lot of employee meals, <coughs> taking someone out to lunch or going out to lunch with a, a legislative official, for example, may be a, a, an appropriate expense to reimburse your employee for that employee's portion of the meal. So they're going to have to submit a receipt. The last thing you want to do is have the receipt say reimbursement for lunch with Senator X and it looks like the employee's taken the senator out to lunch. So train your employees on the, le the reimbursement forms to say for the employee's portion of the meal so that there's no issue with um, records later that would look like you gave gifts that would be prohibited. Review your outside lobbying firm bills to make sure they're not uh, passing through costs for, for meals that would be inappropriate, that it would be illegal for them to have paid for and illegal for you to have paid for. Train your accounting personnel, for example, um, to, to be the first line defense so that if you see a receipt for lunch with Senator so-and-so, the accounting person can go back and make sure that uh, it was just for the employee's portion of the meal. Um, and make sure you're training all your employees. The gift rules, um, as Alex mentioned, non-lobbyists have a different threshold for giving than lobbyists, but if they're expensing it through your organization that's registered, the same rule applies, and so they can't expense a gift even if they could pay for it directly. 
So now we'll uh, open it up to some questions again. Yeah, any questions? I have to keep this very brief because we want to cover the rest of the material right here. So it was a, the, the question was, a federal employee, either a political appointee or a career person, attends a trade association board meeting um, that includes lunch. The criteria with a 25-person board, I believe, is the other, did you say how big the board was? I didn't say. Okay. There well, there's no magic threshold for the executive branch, um, unlike Congress where there is a 25-person rule. Typically, a trade association board is going to be described as widely attended because you've got a variety of interests um, from throughout a given industry present. The career employee has to, th that person's um, agency has to make the determination that it's in the interest of the agency to attend. Um, these days, if the organization is a registered lobbyist, it may be a little tricky. They, the, the administration is just, you know, views lo registering as lobbying as sort of basically putting the scarlet letter R on your forehead. If it's, re if it's relevant to the employee's duties, the agency ethics officer should approve attendance and allow the employee to eat lunch. If it's a political appointee, that person has to have a speaking role. So if they're coming to address your board to talk about federal issues, that someone from the Department of Commerce coming to say, you know, here's how international trade is going, um, that person would be allowed to take the lunch. If they're just sitting there listening to the board meeting, they would not be allowed to eat. Okay, we're going to move on to the next section, but before we get to that, two things. First off, we're obviously covering a wealth of material and can only do it at a very high level. In addition to the PowerPoint itself, which is pretty uh, comprehensive, there is a, a very wide array of uh, supplemental materials, articles, and white papers that we've written on a number of these different topics in a lot more depth that I would definitely uh, encourage you to take a look at to get more information. And another thing that uh, Ron mentioned in terms of compliance with, uh, with gift and ethics rules, but it really applies to everything here. One thing that uh, Ron and Jeff and Alex and myself and others spend a lot of time on these days is going into nonprofit organizations and training staff because it's hard enough for you guys as probably the point person within your organization to understand these rules. But as you can tell, it's really important that everyone else who comes in contact with lobbyists and is taking people out to lunch and, and otherwise is uh, you know, running up against these rules really understands these rules and their complexity. Uh, so it's something that you really ought to consider uh, instituting on a regular basis, either doing it yourselves or bringing in outside experts to do training for your staff in, in, all, of these, in all these areas. Ron? Great. Thanks, Jeff. So now we're going to turn the, <clears throat> turn the page a little bit and talk about something entirely different, and that is super PACs. Um, super PACs are the latest and greatest um, topic these days um, in political law. Uh, they were the result of the Citizens, Un somewhat the result of the Citizens United decision a couple years ago. Let me just take a couple seconds here to, to sort of give a little bit of flavor of the history of where we, how we got to the super PAC, because I think it's a topic that, that's worth understanding, because if, you if you're involved with one, there's a lot of criticism. It helps to be able to defend yourselves a little bit. And also, if you're deciding whether to get involved with one, it helps to understand sort of the framework. We have to... To do this, we have to go back to the mid-70s, um, to, to the, um, when Congress first passed the Federal Election Campaign Act, and the Supreme Court struck down part of it. And what the Supreme Court did in Buckley versus Vallejo, it distinguished between contributions and expenditures. It said, Congress can limit the amount of money you may give to a candidate directly, but it may not limit the amount of money you spend yourself to support a candidate. Um, there was, it, it created a bit of a problem here that has really only been resolved recently, and that is, I may be allowed to write a million dollar check to, to book, pay for media, a media buy to support a candidate. Alex may be allowed to, to do the same thing, but if we come together, create a, a bank account together, and start spending the money together, we become a political committee. And if we're a political committee, then there are contribution limits that apply. So that's the real reason, I think, why you didn't see the super PACs in, in forming over the years is because they faced this, this limitation. If they became a political committee, they couldn't um, accept the unlimited contributions. And so you'd basically have to hire vendors yourself if you're a wealthy person, or if you were an individual, you wouldn't be able to pool your resources in the same way um, to be effective. As a result of, of the Buckley decision, what we started to see was um, issue ads. And, and the reason that we had issue ads was the other piece of Buckley was that it limited the definition of of expenditure to something that expressly advocates the election or defeat of a candidate. So if you say, vote for Joe Blow and spend a million dollars on that, that's an independent expenditure. 
If on the other hand you say, call Senator Smith and tell him to stop beating his wife, it's not um, an, an independent expenditure and it's an issue ad and you're not subject to regulation under the Federal Election Campaign Act. The issue ads proliferated um, over time and so what we then had in 2002 the uh, Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act or, or uh, the McCain-Feingold Law which clamped down on the issue ads, placed limits on um, how they could be funded, uh, prohibited corporations from funding issue ads. There's a number, of, a bit of litigation that went with that. We then started to see the 527 committees, the Swift Boat Vets, MoveOn.org, particularly in the 2004 election, they continue to avoid express advocacy, but now instead of being the political parties, because the, uh, McCain-Feingold stopped the, the, uh, the soft money of the parties, they were independent groups that were um, not connected with the parties to, to, to engage and express in um, issue advocacy. Finally, we were moving along that route. The FEC was trying to figure out if those groups were political committees. They fined several of the groups that were involved in the 2004 election, saying they were political committees that should have been subject to the limits. But we then get in 2010 to Citizens United, which says that corporations have a First Amendment right to make independent expenditures. They'd always, although individuals were allowed to make them, corporations were not. Following on Citizens United, we had another case from the D.C. Circuit called Speech Now, which basically said, yeah, we see the Supreme Court, they're, they're signaling that, that free speech and independent expenditures really is key. We're going to throw out the political committee rules. You can be a political committee, <coughs> um, spend unlimited money on independent expenditures, and accept unlimited contributions. You're now no longer subject to those $5,000 thresholds, and so that is what we get known as the Super PAC or the Independent Expenditure Committee. And what a Super PAC is, is a, a, a political committee registered with either the Federal Election Commission or the equivalent state body, if you're in, involved in state um, elections, that can accept unlimited individual money and unlimited corporate money. Um, it may not make contributions to candidates. It cannot cut a check from its coffers to give to a candidate. It can only pay for its own expenditures, whether it be TV, phones, radio, newspaper, anything like that. It can spend the money directly. The contributions in are fully disclosed to the state elections authority, and the contributions out are fully disclosed. The key is that these organizations cannot coordinate with one of um, with the candidate that they're supporting. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the coordination in a minute. And also, I think a lot of people are surprised when I say that all the contributions in are disclosed because there's a lot of controversy about disclosure. Um, the organizations have to file what are called 24 and 48 hour reports of the independent expenditures they make, saying to whom they paid the money, their consultants that got paid, the media buyers, um, and so forth. They also file quarterly or monthly reports that disclose their, co their contributors in. That's black letter law, very simple. There is something that's controversial though, and that's when nonprofits are involved in the process. So take a, a 501c4 that can accept contributions from individuals and corporations. Those donors to the C4 are not disclosed. The C4 turns around and, and donates some of its money to a super PAC. The super PAC reports the 501c4 as the donor, not the individuals who contributed to the C4. That's the area that people are really concerned about, that there are these companies that are giving, in particular, that are giving to C4s or C6s that are then turning around and giving to the super PACs. Um, my experience has been representing one of the super PACs that supported a presidential candidate. There actually isn't that much money from corporations involved in the super PACs. And there may be some in some of the C4s that are out there but the C4s aren't contributing in large amounts to the, particularly the individual presidential super PACs. It tends, the corporate money you do see tends to be from privately held com companies, not publicly traded companies. So it's an interesting would be dynamic to kind of see how this plays out over the, uh, the coming months. I mentioned coordination, and a lot of people laugh at the idea of coordination um, because they see consultants going from the campaign to the super PACs. They see the candidates talking about what they want the super PACs to do and not do on TV. Uh, things like that. So the coordination regulations in the FEC's um, um, title of the Code of Federal Regulations take page after page after page to explain. They've been through the D.C. Circuit twice now, struck down, they repromulgated, struck down again. They're very complicated, but they're, they're regulations that operate in a core First Amendment area, so there are constraints on how they work. Outside of the common vendor area, and I'll talk about that in a second, there are basically three types of coordination. There is the coordination where the candidate makes a request or suggestion for a contribution or for a particular expenditure and says, you know, I really hope we'll, um, you know, you'll, you'll buy ads in New Hampshire that talk about why I'm a tax cut um, you know, favoring candidate. There's another prong where there's a material involvement where someone from the campaign and someone from the super PAC 
decide together what's going on without any particular request or suggestion. And then the third prong is if there's a substantial discussion. I've yet to figure out exactly how you draw the lines between these three categories. I can't figure out how you have material involvement without a substantial discussion or, quite frankly, without a request or a suggestion. But the FEC has managed to lay out these three different prongs. The other piece is the common vendor, when someone moves from the campaign to the super PAC. And the basic rule is that that vendor may not use material non-public information within 120 days of leaving the campaign. So that's where people hear about sort of the, um, the four-month cooling off period that exists. But if you think about material non-public information, particularly in a presidential campaign, it's kind of interesting. Um, the candidates talk about their plans all the time. The media reports on it. It's public information. So a, a lot of the information that the, the vendors may have is it may be material, but it's not non-public. It's, it's public domain. So in many ways, you can avoid the coordination rules. And this, uh, I agree, it seems silly to a lot of people, and, and it really makes a farce of some of it. If I leak a story to um, the media and they write about all the campaign's plans, then the uh, media planner moves over to the super PAC. It's in the public domain and the person can do it. So I think this is an area that really the public is concerned about. A lot of the good government groups are concerned about. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out as well. Um, the other area that's, that's very interesting is candidate fundraising and whether a candidate appears in an event. They're allowed to do that as long as they don't ask for more than the $5,000, the $2,500 for the primary, $2,500 for the general. So what you, I think, have in certain circumstances where the candidate appears, talks about what a great person the candidate is, leaves the stage, and someone from the super PAC says, great, open up your checkbooks, there's no limit on how much you can give me. That's another area I think that um, leads people to be, shall we say, skeptical of the whole uh, independence of the operation. A couple of things to think about for associations and other nonprofits. Um, for 501c3s, as exciting as the world of super PACs are, you're still out in the dark. You can't, um, as a C3, you're not allowed to do independent expenditures because that would be intervening in an election. Things to keep, keep in mind are the disclosure issues we talked about. Um, obviously, the, the association doesn't have to disclose, but it's important to remember that um, the, the super PAC will be disclosing those donors. And there may be criticism if you're a, a nonprofit that's given to a super PAC, um, whether you're, and you're not obviously disclosing your donors. There are tax limitations imposed on how much of a nonprofit's um, resources can be used for independent expenditures. Basically, in a nutshell, it's less than 50% can be used for, for political activities. More than 50% has to be for non-political activities. And then the other thing to keep in mind is the FEC is, FEC is still noodling about when, when do you become a political committee. And so does the C4, by virtue of, of soliciting contributions for, a, for its super PAC efforts, does it itself become a political committee? And we have to be very careful. You have to make sure you're doing exactly the right things so that you don't trigger those rules. Um, Ron, let me just interject for a second. Uh, we should have said up front, but 501c3s, while they are allowed to lobby within prescribed limits, are absolutely prohibited from engaging in any political campaign activity, which is defined simply as uh, supporting or opposing candidates for public office. So that limitation is going to apply regardless of what uh, federal election rules uh, might otherwise permit. But back to our question in the back of the room about the, the need and, and advantage of a 501c3 setting up an affiliated 501c4 or c6 organization, that allows you to get into this game. It also allows a lot of c3s, uh, say it's a 501c3 professional medical society or educational group, um, and it wants to uh, set up a PAC to solicit members of the association uh, to be able to give directly to candidates for public office. Setting up an affiliated C6, for instance, can enable the, uh, uh, that association to then solicit members, uh, if you create them as members of the C6, solicit them for PAC contributions and have a connected PAC. Exactly. Exactly. And that's my very brief overview on super PACs and what they are, um, how they impact your nonprofit, how you might be involved. We've got a few minutes left. I hope we can open it up for questions um, about super PACs, lobbying disclosure, any of the topics we covered about today. Question, questions from the room? I know your minds are just spinning with all the wealth of information you've had to digest. Yeah, over here. The, the question is whether if a 501c3 gives a plaque, does, does that count as a gift? And so I presume you mean under the gift rules, does that count as a gift? And the federal gift rules include an exemption for awards or plaques. Um, they have to have no independent artistic value. So what you can't do is have the beautiful crystal vase that has a little removable plaque at the bottom. 
um, you have to really has to be kind of the, like a plaque like I showed on the slide. <clears throat> uh, there's a question in the back of the room. Yeah. yeah um, The, so the first question was, do legal compliance, I think I heard this right, do legal and compliance fees to deal with the lobbying disclosure rules, the gift rules, do those count as lobbying costs? Is that, is that the, the question? Yeah, yeah. That, those do not, I, I treat those as legal, legal not lobbying. That, although it sort of, I guess, can be viewed as, as supporting the lobbying, it's really a legal compliance piece and does not get included in the lobbying calculation. The second question was, has there been any effort to raise the limit on the 501H um, number that was set back in the 70s when a million dollars seemed like a lot more than it does perhaps today. And I haven't heard of any recent efforts. Jeff, no, no, I, I, I haven't either, um, unfortunately. Uh, getting back to your, your first question, though, um, keep in mind, though, that don't get caught up on labels. You know, for instance, if you're paying monies to an outside PR firm, um, a lot of times a PR firm will engage in activities that will constitute lobbying, and you will have to count at least some of those costs as lobbying. If you're in that situation, you certainly want to get the PR firm to kind of segregate its time between the lobbying and non-lobbying components of what it's doing so that you don't have to artificially uh, report and or pay or pass on to your members if you're a C6, you know, tax non-deductibility for a larger amount uh, than is necessary. And in terms of kind of internal administration costs, Ron's exactly right in terms of the, the, the legal compliance costs not being counted as lobbying. One thing that Jeff mentioned earlier to keep in mind, under the 501c6 rules under Section 162e, the cost of administering your connected PAC, um, all, all costs of administering that connected PAC and soliciting contributions to the PAC do have to be counted under that lobbying definition, even though it isn't something you would typically think of as a lobbying expense. And in the back of the room, another question? The question is if your outside consultant engages, uh, meets with members of Congress and, or staff, but does not, in their mind, engage in lobbying, um, but you believe it to be a lobbying activity that would be counted in, in, in your lobbying costs. And I think you know, there's, because of the, the double counting that sort of happens between a, a, an organization that has both in-house lobbyists and also outside lobbyists, there's not that, it would be very hard for someone to, to, to look on a one-to-one -one level and figure out that you're counting something that someone else isn't. Um, I think I'd be more concerned really that, the, that the, um, the outside folks really aren't lobbying and that you're really comfortable that what they're doing isn't lobbying, that they're not discussing your issues with the members of Congress um, in a way that should be disclosed as lobbying. I think that it's kind of, hard to see exactly what they might be saying if they're introducing you or discussing your issues with them that, that it wouldn't be considered lobbying, quite frankly. Yeah, some of it's going to depend on the substance of the, converse, substance of the conversation. We talked about the fact that lobbying, at least under, say, the tax code definitions, um, when you're talking about members of Congress and their staffs, is generally where you're trying to influence legislation. Uh, whereas if you're just talking more generally about your particular industry or issue or, or just a get-to-know-you type meeting, that in and of itself may not be a lobbying communication, and they may properly not view it as a lobbying communication, your outside consultant. But if you are hiring them to do that, to lay the groundwork for a later lobbying communication that you're going to make, then as we said earlier, at least some of that cost, if not all of it, needs to be treated, should be treated by you as a lobbying cost. And we always encourage our, our clients, the nonprofits, to ensure that their outside consultants and lobbying firms and PR firms are properly allocating expenses in their bills to you so you know how to treat those accordingly. Uh, we have time for one more question. Right here. Jeff, uh, media advertising for what I call image enhancement, dueling contractors for a new bomber contract, and they say we have subcontractors, all small businesses, and 
42 of the 50 states, and this is going to be 10,000 jobs, and I think we've all seen those. Uh, I've always wondered whether uh, that's disguised lobbying. Is there any uh, legislative or uh, regulatory uh, requirements on that type of, of uh, media advertising? So the question is um, whether media buys that sort of do general um, image enhancement, um, talking about sort of subcontracts that are going to generate jobs, things like that, whether that's lobbying. And I think this is one in particular where you have to think about which definition we're talking about. If it's lobbying under the Lobbying Disclosure Act, it, although it could arguably be an activity to further lobbying, generally most people take the view that it's not a communication, it's not like producing a report that's going to be used in a communication, it's a little one step removed, and most people don't count that in their lobbying disclosure report if they're using the LDA definitions. I think looking at Section 162E, the, the part for trade associations, where grassroots lobbying is counted, now it's probably not gra true grassroots lobbying because it's not calling on a member of Congress to, to vote yes on a particular bill. That's, I think, maybe more likely to be counted, and you would really have to look particularly at the exact messaging and how it fits into the overall strategy of what you're, you're trying to accomplish. Um, there's no sort of simple answer on that front. Yeah, it's very much going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, and, and we frequently do review our, our clients' ads uh, for, for multiple reasons, but in part to help determine uh, whether some part has to be considered a lobbying cost, because obviously those costs can be quite significant that you're spending on media buys, so that can have a big impact on your lobbying totals. Okay, with that, we've uh, run out of time. I want to thank our, our speakers very much for a very informative uh, presentation. Thank you all for coming and for joining us on the phone. We look forward to seeing you here at our next program. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.